Welcome to Writer's Digest Presents. Hosted by the editors of Writer's Digest, this monthly podcast features conversations with writing and publishing experts whose insights will help ignite your creative vision, hone your skills, build your platform, and get your work out into the world. Hello, and welcome to Writer's Digest Presents. I'm Editor-in-Chief Amy Jones, alongside Senior Editor Robert Lee Brewer and Editor Michael Woodson. As we move into the warmer months, we start looking forward to our favorite event of the summer, the Writer's Digest Annual Conference, this year happening in New York City, August 17th through 20th. Because going to a writer's conference for the first time can be anxiety-inducing, we've got a special guest with us today to help share what to expect. Please welcome WDC speaker and WD contributing editor, Ryan G. Van Cleave. Hi, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me today. So today, since we're talking about what to expect at the Writer's Digest annual conference, I think we should start at the beginning with the basics, which is that the main conference is three days, Friday through Sunday, with an optional day of pre-conference workshops on Thursday. So let's talk about the pre-conference workshops. Ryan, you are teaching one this year. Can you tell us about what your workshop will be focused on? Mine is on the business of creative writing. Uh, Years ago, I realized that uh, I had to learn the business of writing to be successful at writing. And I've got Mm -hmm. a doctorate in creative writing and no one ever talked to me about things like intellectual property, even how to submit work. I had to figure it all out myself and it took a long time. So I actually teach two different classes on this at Ringling College where I run the creative writing program there. And it's a game changer for students. They become professionals from day one And a lot of those same techniques are things other people don't know, too. So I'm going to explore things like uh, just your relationship to the world of writing and how to, you know, improve it in terms of having patterns and setting yourself up for success, uh, using the right tools, um, thinking about how to make the lives of bookstore sellers easier, you Mm -hmm. know, things about taxes, intellectual property, copyright. Um, things not to do, things to do. It's all the stuff I've learned in the School of Hard Knocks over 25 years, all condensed into one day of hopefully game-changing things for, you know, for the attendees. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I really love about the option to have these pre-conference workshops is that it's a full day intensive on a particular topic like this. So you can really get into the nitty gritty of, the business of creative writing and talk about all of those different business aspects and um, how to structure your time as a freelancer so that you can make money with your writing. Um, <clears throat> and I, th- what's, what's also interesting about these workshops is that, so we've got three of them going on on that day. One um, about the craft of writing, the structure, essential supporting elements of story with Tiffany Yates Martin, and then an indie publishing workshop about how to be a self-published, independent, independently published author with Maddie Dalrymple and Michael LeBron. But because all three of those are going on at the same time, each of you instructors can structure your day the way you want to mm-hmm. and really focus on what the students in your class need from you. So you can take your breaks at whatever time you want. You can have your lunch at whatever time you want. And you can guide the teaching to the people in your class. I don't really have a question about that. (laughs) It's just one of the things that I think is um, different and exciting than the regular conference, which, you know, have these hour-long sessions. Totally. And uh, you mentioned regular conference. The the, the, The regular conference or the basic conference, as it's listed on our website, is structured totally differently. It's broken up into several tracks of content with multiple hour-long sessions per day. Um, So let's talk about this part of the conference um, a little bit. How do you structure the hour-long classes that you teach? It's a great question. I think about this all the time uh, because I want to make things as impactful as possible, but you also want a a sense of interaction. So yeah, um, I try to, it's the same way I schedule classes that I teach. I chunk things up. You know, I try to make a groups where things kind of adhere together, try to have something that people are doing and try to have really meaningful takeaways. If you don't have meaningful takeaways, then what are you doing? You're just sitting there and listening to people talk about things they're really interested in. And that's not teaching. That's not learning. That's not why you go to these kinds of things. So we really try to make a a sense to have a, have an arc and almost a story to the conversation that we're having. So there's a focus. So for my fantasy conversation, 
we're gonna kind of follow a fantasy journey sort of through it and sort of do some of the things that we're doing but it is a compressed time it, it is a challenge in one hour to cover yeah. in some cases uh something that you could spend a, a day or more on uh in terms of your own knowledge and also the audience interest so there's always a negotiation there and i guess that's something i would just say is temper your expectations you're not going to have an exhaustive mm -hmm. comprehensive understanding of a thing by going to an hour panel and you might not even go into a full day panel, but it's going to start you with some good information, point you in the right directions, kind of curate some of the resources that are out there and help you develop appropriate next steps. And there might be some uh, breakthroughs of one type or another. One aha moment is mm -hmm. worth the price of admission. And I'm hoping that every single session delivers in that hour. I'm hoping in my full day session, there's three or four significant aha moments because those can be priceless if it's the right one at the right time. And you never know what those are, but if you keep yeah. your ears open, you take good notes, you listen, and you're really present, you can get a lot out of a conference like this. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you mentioned interaction and um, something we really encourage is audience questions. And I am curious, what kind of questions do you find useful um, both for you and for the people, other people who are in attendance of the um, session? Uh, it's a great question to talk about questions. A lot of people are scared to ask questions and yeah. you should not be scared to ask questions. However, you should always understand what's a question that is uniquely appropriate only to me. That's a good after, you know, between session or after kind of, you know, hey, I've got this thing and it, no one else is going to care about this, but I really do. That's a private question. Ask that later versus in the large form. But if you have a basic question, particularly if it's a clarification, could you give me an example of this thing you talked about? Things like that, or I'm not quite sure I understand this, or you said this and now I'm thinking this. Those are things a lot of people could probably learn from and would appreciate sure. hearing. So that's a great way to utilize those 10 minutes at the end or whatever kind of time you set aside for those Q&A, because oftentimes that's the way to make sure someone gets the most meaningful thing out of it. You can't always get it in what you pre-prepare. You know what I mean? You do your best, yeah. but not everyone comes with the same level of background or interest or outcomes. So those questions are a way to kind of individualize it a little bit. And so that's a great way to think about it. Yeah. And something too, like the, uh, a couple of things for people to remember with the, these sessions is last year was my first um, in-person conference. And the things that I was surprised about was, you know, there's 15 minutes between sessions and on one hand, that feels like it could be a lot of times. On the other hand, it's like that flies by. And so like remembering that not all classes are held in the same place. So like those 15 minutes, uh, you have to decide really how to use that time. We have um, vendors in the hallway. It's an opportunity to meet the other attendees um, as well as get to the next class. Um, those are just things that like, for me personally, I'd be sitting in the back of the room being like, okay, I got 15 minutes before the next session. And then it was like suddenly starting again. So if you are interested in coming, um, remembering to like plan your time wisely um, if you are attending for this basic conference. Yeah. And I think we have the, um, we have the program in the goodie bag that you get when you register, but it's also on the conference website. So what I like to do is, yeah. um, pick the sessions that I think I want to go to before the day even begins. So I can map out where, um, which room I need to be in. Um, <clears throat> but then the other part of that is if you go to a class and Ryan, I would love your perspective on this as a, as an instructor, if you go to a class and it's not what you think, it's not what you expected from the class. Um, remember you, you paid your hard earned money to attend this conference. So if the yeah. session isn't, if you aren't getting from it, what you, um, what you were hoping for or <clears throat> whatever, and there's another session that during that same time that might be more pertinent, don't be afraid to get up and switch ses sessions. Um, I would say be totally. thoughtful about the slamming of the doors, but, <laughs> <laughs> and try not to be disruptive when you do that. But this is your time to, yeah. to learn and build your, um, your writing career. So switch sessions if you need to. How do you feel about that from an instructor standpoint, Ryan? Well, it's a little bit different. I've got a semester long class, you know, but you do have that first week <laughs> where it's add drop. Like if it doesn't work, like get yeah. out, like get out. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, some students even overload and take one too many classes figuring they're gonna drop one. So like there's strategies you can do there that are analogous to what you're saying. But what you're saying is again, something that's really important. And one of the first things I'm gonna talk about in my business of creative writing session, professionalism. Mm -hmm. I don't work with people who aren't professionals. I will never work with you again if you prove to me you're not a professional because you're making my life harder. You're being rude and sensitive. You don't know the industry. I don't have time for that. And no professional does. And part of being a professional is how you behave. I tell my students all the time, when you go to a session at a thing like this, where there's concurrent sessions, if you're not sure this is for you, sit on the end or in the mm -hmm. back so you can get up without making a big fuss and having all this mm -hmm. to do and having people move, right? Because that's, you know, it's pain. Mm -hmm. And then quietly leave. And that's a professional way to make a smart business choice about how can I get value for my money, right? So if you're not mm -hmm. sure, sit on the end so you can easily get out or in the back so you don't have to make a big production. If you sit in the front row and then five minutes in, you get up and you gather your bags, you put your laptop away, you zip up your backpack. It's a fuss. <laughs> it's annoying. Yeah. Everyone sees mm -hmm. you. It's distracting. So, you know, make a smart choice. But it is not wrong. It is not incorrect if you do it in the right kind of way. You do want value. And I'm looking at the list here. There's there's tons of ones. The challenge is there's probably two good ones at the same time. So what you might yeah. do is in those sessions as you 15 minutes here and there, you meet people at coffee, you ask them what they're going to. If you find someone you buddy up with and they're going to something different, you want to swap notes or talk after that way you can kind of get the best of both rather than feel like you have to choose because in some cases, it's like they're both great and you're going to feel like you're missing out even if you're in the right one for you. So that's another challenge that's – it's a good challenge to have. Yeah. yeah. And I will say the majority of the sessions will be recorded. So if you are struggling – to decide between two sessions at the same time and the one you're in is exactly what you were hoping for, but you're still bummed about missing out on the other one, chances are it's going to be recorded and you'll get it after the conference. So you can always listen in that way. There are just a handful that aren't, um, the instructors teach these classes, you know, in other settings and they want hmm. to retain that material for their other yeah. instructional settings. Um, so Ryan, when you aren't teaching sessions at the conference, because we, a lot of our instructors at the event will teach one or two sessions, but never more than that, because we like to have a variety of people and topics. So when you aren't teaching your sessions, what do you do with your time at the event? Well, of course, you know, being in New York, I tend to do New York-y things, but <laughs> here in the conference proper, um, I tend to actually sneak around and sit in the back and attend things and just kind of, you know, ob observe what I can as much as uh, how do people present. Like, I'm always looking mm -hmm. to learn, like, you know, someone's a really good speaker or or the content interests me or both, um, or I'm just paying attention to how other people are and like, what kind of questions do they have or what are they interested in? Because, I'm not just a conference presenter. I'm a writer, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm also a writing coach and a teacher. So I'm always interested in what the market is, both as writers and creators, but also the people who consume that, which is writers, but other people too. And so I'll spend a lot of time walking around talking to people who, you know, working behind the tables, um, you know, just the, the, and anyone I run across and having a good time there. There, there are some people who go to these things and they don't show up for much other than their own events. I understand that because if you're doing a good job, it is a lot of mental energy. Even if you've mm -hmm. done that presentation before, to be on and have your A game up. Remember, writers and creatives are often introverts. Mm -hmm. So it is not your natural inclination to stand in front of people and be on and do your thing. Like that hour long thing could burn some people out. They may not be around the rest of that day, but hopefully they are around for some of those casual conversations for those very uniquely personal things or just people wanting to know more in general and just hear from people. Cause you can learn a lot from casual conversations, even the ones where you're just listening to them talk to other people in a small group setting. Sometimes just that gives you those aha moments or gives you that sense of camaraderie or community that is so important for writers to succeed. And that's a big thing that a, an event like this produces, a sense of community. Because so much yes. of us mm -hmm. is what we're doing. We're sitting in our rooms. We're all doing that right now. We're all independent doing our yeah. own things. Yeah. This is kind of community here, but Zoom isn't real community. This is real community. So hopefully friendships and potential partnerships totally. and just uh, you know an appreciation for other people and a shared endeavor like that, that can get you going for another month or two, which is really energizing and terrific. Yeah, yeah. I always feel like that specifically is 
like the greatest benefit of writing conference is that you're in an event with, you know, hundreds of other people who are interested in the same exact thing that you are, that a lot of times, at least in, in my case, in my world, 365, usually people just aren't interested in writing, you know, when I'm talking to my neighbors and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But when you're at that writing conference, you are surrounded by people who, even if they're writing in a different genre than you, like really care about writing and uh, all the same things that, that you care about, even if it's uh, doing it a, a different way. Well, and I think for me, one of the um, toughest things for me to learn, because like you said, Ryan, I am an introvert and it takes a lot of energy out of me to be in front of and talking to people all day long. <laughs> and it is not my natural state to go up and introduce myself to people, especially um, writers who, and instructors whose work I admire. But over the years attending several of these conferences now, I figured out that, um, you know, if you're just kind and ask questions to the other writers, even if they, you know, are somebody that you have admired from a distance for a while, they were in your shoes at one point. Um, mm -hmm. So take that opportunity to talk to them and have a genuine conversation with them um, because chances are they also, like you said, are an introvert and maybe struggle with introducing themselves to totally. um, new and different people. It doesn't and come naturally for everyone. <laughs> I had a professor in college tell me once, because because authors are relatively introverted and it's not as, it's it's um, infrequent we get to meet writers that we admire. If you mm -hmm. have the opportunity to, you have to tell them what their work means to you. And I oh, was yeah. like, wow, okay. So I really took that seriously when she told me that and very few opportunities since, I mean, now I very luckily work for Writer's Digest, but like in the time before, I was like, I'm not meeting any of these people I'm reading. And uh, like I said, last year was my first in-person and there were several authors there who I'd read. Um, and it, I never thought I'd meet in person. Like we had Robert Jones Jr. there last year and his book, The Prophets was unbelievable. And I'd had the opportunity of interviewing him like a year before, but I was still like so nervous to go up to him and be like, hi, like my name is Michael. I know you <laughs> and thank you for writing this book. But it was like a very few opportunities to get to do that. And even doing that, like as an introvert helps me be less introverted. Like it really is just like, just do it once. They really value and love that. And um, it just helps build that community for sure. It's yep, interesting absolutely. how much of this conversation today is really about my full day workshop on the business of creative writing. And this is another <laughs> topic I spend a lot of time with students talking about literary citizenship. Mm. It's part of being a literary citizen. It's not just being a consumer, but interacting meaningfully. Now that doesn't mean like send Stephen King 40 emails. No, <laughs> it's a, but I have them reach out to someone whose work they admired and you'd be shocked by how big of names some of these people are yes. who you respond. I tell them mm -hmm. their time is invaluable don't burn a lot. But if you if you just say two or three sentences about what their work means to you and ask them one specific question and one only, and they know you're a student, they will often respond or at least they'll read it. And you can have that same kind of interaction in, in person as well, too, as long as you're respectful yeah. and you're actually present and you do mm -hmm. it with this sort of sense of uh, appreciation and community. That's exactly what literary citizen mm -hmm. can be. It's also being part of the world and going to conferences. Uh, reading books and then posting them on Goodreads or uh, mm -hmm. Amazon reviews. And, you know, this is all part of the big circle. You don't just want to be a taker. You want to be a giver. And that's, that's mm -hmm. again, part mm -hmm. of it, this, this kind of mentality. And sometimes just giving them appreciation. We don't get a lot sometimes. And uh, some of us could, you know, really benefit from a little bit more, even the famous people. We want them to keep writing, yeah. say that thing. If it's true and earnest, why not? Yeah, I'm reminded of, yeah. Um you know, the submission or the customer service email inbox we have for Writer's Digest, most of the time, the only things we get are, um, you know, complaints <laughs> or yep. when something is, when you know, when there's a mistake and someone has very kindly pointed it out that it's, <laughs> and it's in the print issue and we can't do anything about it. Um, so it's, you know, all of those other times, 99% of the time, people like 
what you're doing. They just don't tell you. And so I feel like it's the same thing with, with writers and authors, you know, oftentimes they don't hear the nice things that people think about them, you know, Mm -hmm. or they'll get the email pointing out the one typo that made it through (laughs) all of the rounds of editing. And so to have somebody come up and say something nice about your work can just be invaluable. Um, Mm -hmm. It's something that people remember. Um, One of my favorite parts of the conference is the keynotes. Uh, This year, our opening keynote is Chuck Wendig. He's the author of books like Wanderers and Wayward, The Book of Accidents, and several Writer's Digest uh, books, including a new one that's coming out this summer, Gentle Writing Advice. Um, Our central keynote is Elizabeth Acevedo. She was the cover interview for our September-October 2021 issue. Um, Her first novel for adults comes out this August called Family Lore. And our closing keynote is Jason Mott, who won the National Book Award in 2021 for his novel Hell of a Book, which is about a writer going on a speaking tour for his novel. (laughs) Um, And I love these keynotes because it's a chance to hear from, you know, these authors that I have Mm -hmm. such huge respect for and they're speaking directly to us about a topic that they don't often get to talk about, which is the life of being a writer. Mm. You know, so often when they do interviews with, um, you know, mainstream media, it's, you know, the key points of their newest book release and they're, you get the same kind of rote answers about, you know, what's the story behind your book? But in this setting, they're talking to writers about writing, and I feel like we get a different sense of who they are, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, sort of a behind-the-scenes picture that other people don't necessarily get. Uh, what do you all like about the keynotes at the conference? As I've said a thousand times, last year was my first in-person, and um, I d- was I did just didn't know what to expect with them, and I was so in my head about being there as an employee that I uh, uh, was just more concerned in the moment of like doing my job well. And then when um, we got to the opening keynote, which was Beverly Jenkins last year, the, I was, I just felt so emotional listening to her talk. And then the way she interacted with the people who asked really lovely questions and also wanted to tell her like, your work has changed my life. I've been reading your books for years. Um, I just was not prepared for that feeling at all. And so every day I was just like anxious in the best way, waiting for the next keynote uh, speak speech. And um, I learned a lot last year from the conference, but that was a great, it felt like sort of um, every day was like the culmination of, of the day's sessions ended in this like really lovely, like, um, thing that everyone got to attend that uh, everyone could attend regardless of their genre and should attend regardless of their genre. Um, I learned a lot from those as a writer, learned a lot from those um, keynote speeches and none of them were the genres that I want to write in. Yeah. I think often with the keynotes, what I find is that uh, they really are like kind of like that cherry on top of, Mm -hmm. you know, that day of uh, events and, And, you know, like I've seen so many, like, like you mentioned, Michael, sometimes like they are very emotional. Um, I know there was at least one or two last year that actually had me tearing up Mm -hmm. uh, during the actual keynote. Uh, There have been others where, you know, like they they don't make me tear up, but they make me laugh throughout. Um, Or, you know, like I just feel fired up at the end of it, it. You know, I'm going to go. Like, I'm not going to write the book that that keynote speaker had, but I'm going to go do something now because I'm like all fired up uh, from what they just went through. And and I think like that's one of the things about the keynote that uh, when I first started working uh, on different conferences and attending different conferences, like I always thought of the keynote as like just this like kind of general thing that I'm not going to get a lot out of, uh, which is totally wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. They're always very uh they they do it in different ways but the authors are that do these keynotes are always like have me ready to go do something Mm -hmm. and feel a certain way at the end of the day 
I think that's key. We got to remember too, by choosing to come to this conference, which again is an act of professionalism and saying, I'm going to do something, I'm going to improve. Um, we're an affinity group. We're a very focused affinity group who all have this very clear shared mission and identity. Whereas if you caught uh, any of these writers out in the world that, you know, a, a library keynote or, you know, a fundraiser, there's all kinds of keynotes that are out there. Be very different. I'm sure they're great, but they have a different function. For us, they all understand this is a very specific demographic who has very specific interests and they're going to deliver because they are experts in it. They get to be a keynote speaker by virtue of having deep experience and, and profound insight and wisdom at some level, even early in their career for some of them uh, in a way that we can learn about those things, but they contextualize it. And that's what's so important. I'll give you an example. Uh, my first New York event was right after my uh, Weekend Book Proposal book came out around 2010 or something like this, 2011. And Harlan Coben was one of the keynote speakers. I, I knew he was, I, you know, I know who everyone is. I just hadn't read any of his books. He was amazing. Like mm -hmm. he was amazing. And he had the behind the scenes stuff and talked about his own struggles. Like, really? You struggle? Like just hearing that's like, <laughs> okay, maybe my struggles aren't so bad. But the way he talked about how he designed stories and kind of did things, not super nuts and boltsy like you get in an actual hour long workshop and these other things, but kind of in general, it sounded like he really knew what he was talking about and had a real, a real kind of unique sense about it. I have mm -hmm. gone on to read nearly everything he's written since then. And he's really good. He's like really good. But even having not read a single thing he's ever written in his entire life, that was a dynamite keynote that I remember 11 yeah. years later. Like, you know, it's an area I had not written in before then either, but maybe I will someday now. I'm still right. kind of thinking about it. You know, he's really good at pacing. He's really good at a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And he won me over. So he doesn't have to be like, mm -hmm. well, I'm a poet, so I need a poet. Or something. Yes, but you don't have to. Everyone is really good at communicating and creating connecting with an audience and using language in powerful, meaningful, evocative ways. They all are. And you can all learn from that, even if it's not in your lane as you see it. We're all in the mm. same lane by virtue of coming to this yeah. conference. And that's that's really the key. You know, you can learn from anybody. So have your ears open and your heart open and your mind open the entire time because you just never know when the truly magic moments are going to happen. Oftentimes it's the big people, but not always. Yeah, exactly. It kind of creates that, um, I don't know, I feel like all three of you have mentioned it, it kind of creates this atmosphere um, at those mm. keynotes where it it really does feel like a community and it's very inspiring and uplifting even after you've heard the story of, you know, how many times Marlon James was rejected <laughs> before he got his first acceptance. But it's nice to know that these people have experienced that too, mm -hmm. that what you're going through is not um, unique to you. It's, it's such an empowering feeling to know that, um, well, and Tiffany D Jackson last year, mm -hmm. I mean, she actually attended the conference as an attendee several times before, you know, being a New York times bestseller and the keynote at the conference. Um, so she was, had literally been in the shoes of the people sitting in the audience, um, before getting behind the podium. And I think that's very empowering. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that I really enjoy about it is the book signing afterward. Mm -hmm. um, I I love having signed copies of books um, from authors that I've met. Maybe that's the book dork in me. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just like commemorating that moment where I've met this person mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate their work. So having that um having that book signing afterward is a lot of fun i think yeah something else too one part of the conference that involves sort of a lot of anxiety for um a lot of our attendees is the pitch slam uh this year we're doing things slightly different and having it on friday instead of saturday this is the event where people sign up to pitch their book ideas to agents the agents are sitting at individual tables in a large room and you go to the agent or agents you think would be a good fit for you and your book and tell them your idea but you only get three minutes with each agent. So it's important to have your book pitch ready. Robert, you've organized the pitch slam for years now. Um, what should people expect and what can they expect? Well, um, you already mentioned some of it is there's going to probably be a lot of anxiety. Um, <laughs> as uh, you know, there, there are a few 
uh, extroverted writers out there, but uh, as we've mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of introverted writers. So this is, it takes a lot of building up to, and I recognize that for a lot of people. Um, so, so there's a lot of energy. Um, one thing to remember is that a lot of the agents and editors are also introverted and they feel that same energy before we release you into the room <laughs> to, to pitch them. A lot of them also want the same thing that you want. Um, they, they want a successful book. Um, we, we have agents. Uh, I should also mention, we also have editors that uh, participate in the pitch slam, uh, which means honestly, like this is one of the few events where, uh, you know, I, I can't remember which editors have signed on yet, but like you actually have access to pitch a big five mm -hmm. publisher acquiring editor. Um, a lot of times writers don't get that direct access. They have to get an agent first before they can get that pitch onto the desk of an acquiring editor. Um, so there, you know, we've, we've had uh, many success stories. Mm -hmm. uh, we've tried to share those on uh, writersdigest.com uh, because, uh, and that's why agents and editors, we have some agents that have been, they as soon as I ask them if they want to participate, like they're on board, there are some that reach out to me and ask like, have you started sending, you know, mm -hmm. out invites for doing the pitch slam because I've found writers this way. Uh, because we also recognize that because it takes so much energy for a writer to get to that point where they're pitching in person, uh, for many of these writers being introverted, like it takes a lot of effort and work and energy to get up there that they are taking this very seriously, mm -hmm. uh, when, when they show up. Um, so, so many, um, success stories do that, but basically like when you get in there, um, one thing. I sometimes have to recommend to people in person is, you know, just take a, a deep breath. You've got like a whole hour. Um, mm -hmm. It often goes by very quickly, but, uh, you know, know ahead of time. Uh, we, we share on the Writer's Digest conference site what the different agents and editors uh, represent. Know ahead of time, like a game plan of like, I would like to talk to X, Y, and Z. When you come into the room, we usually have them alphabetized by their last name. So you can, that's an easy way to figure out where they're at spatially when you're in there. I think we usually have a map as well that we share uh, ahead of the event. But um, come in. If there's not a long line, uh, go to the first agent or editor on your list. If there is a long line, one of my suggestions is see if another person on your list has a short line, go there first, and then hopefully while you're pitching that editor agent, the other line that's like kind of long has gotten shorter. And it's a good way to um, kind of manage your time uh, because some people will just come in and, and they might start at the A's and the alphabet. Mm -hmm. So then you have these long lines and that means you have to wait for people to pitch ahead of you before you get in. You might pitch fewer people that way. So so that's one good way to uh, get more access as well. Doesn't that kind of also help you like practice your pitch? Totally. Um, yeah. Before maybe hitting the number one person on your list. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can... yeah. In fact, a lot of times I think they uh, recommend in the pitch <clears throat> tips session that they usually do at the conference to do that, to mm -hmm. uh, not go straight to the first person because you've got to think you've got all this energy just pitching one person and realizing that they're not going to throw tomatoes at you because nobody's ever right. thrown tomatoes <laughs> at anyone <laughs> during these pitches. Everyone's very kind, very nice. Uh, just getting that energy out uh, is very helpful as well, because then then when you do uh, give your pitch that second, third time, you start to just feel more comfortable and, and realize like these are just conversations. Totally. And also realize like three minutes does go by quickly, but your pitch should be less than a minute 
And then you've got two minutes where you get to talk. And uh, the agents and editors usually have questions about like your project. So um, also feel like you don't need to just be like, my book is blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, you can really like take your time uh, and, and have a conversation uh, as well. Yeah, I think like something, anyone who's attending or signing up to do the pitch slam, we've talked about this before as a team, but um, it could be easy to feel like it didn't go well or was a failure if you don't get anything out of it, like a someone wants your pages. But I think doing it at all is, is a success because it is hard. It's really hard to pitch your work and, and do it well and, and get better at it within an hour and... I just want our attendees to know that like you will still have the best time. This will be a very stressful hour of, of what is three full days and try to still have fun because like doing it at all, you should consider, consider that a success and a successful step in your um, writing career. Yeah. And, and we'll get, we'll get authors to get requests um, during the pitch line. We, we usually yeah. have, quite a few actually because our writers are so prepared and have great ideas but uh, even authors who don't get as many usually come up and say like I've learned so much totally. during these conversations about what to do um, during the pitch slam I mean in some ways like you really learn so much about your specific project kind of like mm. how ryan mentioned earlier like the specific questions versus the more general questions that you might ask during a session uh you can really get into the nitty-gritty about like your not only your pitch but also like the, the whole concept for your book mm. and um and some sometimes maybe even like the book itself is is fine but you're you're learning a lot about like how to package that um in a way that that agents and editors care about. I would add this too. It's not a competitive event. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to think I'm going to beat up Michael and Robert and like, or what, like there's only one golden yeah. Willy Wonka ticket and I'm going to get it from that. <laughs> like it's, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But totally. This is the idea about giving and getting. If you just give and be part of the community in a positive way and you're a good person, I mean, here's here's the formula I tell my students all the time. Be a good person, do good work, persist, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the formula, you know? Like if you have like, uh, you know, relatives in the industry or you're really lucky or you're super charismatic, like those are all great too, but those three things are the key, right? Be a good person, do good work, and just keep doing it. That's the formula that wins out again and again, again, over all the fluky, all the other stuff. I don't think about it as a competition. Someone else's success doesn't limit my opportunity. It opens up new possibilities. That's the mentality to do this. Otherwise, it puts weird stress on stuff. You don't want to talk to anybody because people will ask you, hey, Robert, what are you working on? Very common question at a thing like this. I'm not telling. Like, it's really get weird and cagey. Like, it's a bad vibe. It's like, I don't want, like, you know, fine. You don't have to share, but you should think about the questions that you want to ask of other people and they'll ask of you and kind of have an answer ready to go as well, too. Almost like a little mini pitch, you know? Maybe it's not your secret project. Maybe it's a different project you could just talk about. Just so you can share and kind of connect in these sorts of ways. Um, just, you know, be ready. Prepare for that conference in those ways and be willing to give and participate and not just take, take, take 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 and it is not a competition there's no winning mm -hmm. the winning is this commitment to your professionalism and your improvement as a creator that's it and you're going to get a lot of that in a lot of different ways if you have that attitude this is a solid investment that you will uh, be pleased about afterwards you'll be energized you might make some connections you're going to just feel a bigger part of this community and it's going to be a positive experience with that kind of mentality yeah, and, and that's a really good point, too, is, like, just to remember, and, and I think, like, it's easy to get, like, nervous before an event like this, whether you're doing the pitch slam or just going to the conference in general, is remember, like, all of us care about the same thing, and we all, like, want, we want good things to happen, not not only for us, but for other people, and 
uh, you know, we all want to read uh, the next great book. Uh, as a writer, I want to read the next great book. As an editor, I want to read the next great book. Uh, the agents, they want to read the next, you know, everyone here like wants the same things to happen. And, and we, you know, and I always feel like the Writer's Digest Conference is like this huge celebration mm -hmm. of writing. Yeah, it does feel like that. And I think part of <clears throat> one, I can't remember who mentioned it, but we did mention that we were switching the uh, pitch slam from Saturday to Friday. And I think one of the reasons that we specifically talked about internally doing that is um, because there are so many nerves around mm -hmm. the pitch slam and having that full day on Friday um, before the pitch slam on Saturday, we could just, we could see the energy um, people getting nervous a whole day ahead of time. Or we heard stories of people skipping sessions to go back to their room and work on their pitches, which if that's how you want to spend your time, go for it. But don't forget, you also are coming to the conference to attend the sessions and learn new things. So we wanted to have the, um, what is it, the Pitch Perfect session where we give mm -hmm. more advice like this well before the conference. So you've got a couple of weeks to work on your pitch. and come and get it out of the way on the first day. Yeah, that way totally. you can enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, take whatever feedback you got during the pitch slam and um, use that to map out whatever other sessions you're going to attend, whatever you have learned that you want to work on um, or, or learn mm -hmm. in the rest of your time there. So we've talked about the general workings of the conference at this point, all of the key events that happen there, but and we've kind of alluded to this a little bit, but I want to talk about the general feel of the conference. Um, I remember being so incredibly nervous before attending my first one, and part of that was being a new WD employee at the time and just, like Michael said, wanting to do a good job at my job, <laughs> but also not knowing at all what to expect, <laughs> having not been to a writer's conference before. But then getting there and having like the best time and mm -hmm. being totally surprised by how um, how much fun it was and how much energy everyone had and how supportive everyone was. Um, what do you all remember about your first writers conference, whether the writers digest conference or a different one, like before, during and after Ryan, maybe you do want to kick us off. Um, yeah. So I've been in this game for a long time and I've been to a lot of conferences before I guess the thing is, it's it it can feel overwhelming if you're not prepared mm. for it. You know, I've been to some very big ones like AWP, the Associated Writers and Writing Programs, and this was back when it was like ten thousand or twelve thousand, tons of people. Wow. So, I guess it's saying you don't have to do everything. Like that's part because you almost right. feel like oh, I gotta do everything. Well, you, you can't. It's not even designed that way. So, like, just get that aside right now. Um, make sure that you take some moments to sort of decompress. Sometimes that fifteen minutes is just like. Whoo, yeah. you know, just, yeah. just, you need it on yourself and like watch for that other people. Don't inflict yourself on someone else. If you can tell that they're taking some downtime that's much needed. And that includes speakers. Sometimes too, you can tell they just need a moment to kind of collect themselves. But I mean, the, just the, the energy of being at these things is the reward in and of itself. I mean, sure you get knowledge and you get all these other kinds of wonderful opportunities. But to me, I, if, if the conference is done right and I do it right, I leave inspired for a month. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it. So like, there's a lot of writers I know who will do one every three or four months. You know, they might do the romance writers one, or they might do the society children's book writers, or illustrators, or some kind of local chapter, like, you know, um, you know, sisters in crime, just various versions of this to bring people together. So you get re-inspired. And like, for some people, that's part of your process. And I think it, it's a reasonable way to do it too, because it gets you outside of your own little comfort zone and thinking about the bigger picture. So I've always just been able to do that. I still go, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't go to these things thinking I'm going to learn tons of new stuff, but I always learn tons of new stuff. Oftentimes it's hearing someone talk about something I, I know, but in a new way, or sometimes mm -hmm. there's just like slightly different sorts of ways of thinking about some, it gives examples. It helps me as a teacher. It helps me as a writer. It helps me as an editor, as writing my pieces for writer's digest as a presenter 
anyone at any level with the right attitude can get a lot out of a conference. And just, I've had a blast, including the Writer's Digest ones, the online and the live ones. So, mm. yay. <laughs> yeah, I cannot really remember my first one. Been doing it for so long. Uh, but I will say I remember last year coming back after being out with uh, the COVID stuff and being, you know, isolated for a long time. And as an introvert, I started thinking like, I don't, I don't know if I want to be around a lot of people again. <laughs> like, <laughs> like so sometimes you like start to really like get into that shell and think like, you know, this is what I want is to be away from everyone. And I forgot how much I miss, even as an introvert, being around all the other writers and being around all of that energy. And as men as Ryan mentioned, like, just like, you know, I've been doing this for a really long time, but I'm always learning new stuff at these events. And I always feel uh, so inspired to do new things or to try new things or to go back to a project that I'd been working on, but like kind of set aside and, and, you know, these events, like, give me the energy to like, oh, I want to go. Uh, I think I know how, how to solve this problem that mm -hmm. I've been having with this one manuscript. So um, I, I think like, for me, like that, that's, I, I can't really remember the first one, but last year, like, just reminded me how much uh, going to the conferences uh, means to me just to be around everyone. Yeah, my first one was the last virtual one we did, which is in 2021. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so nervous for the in-person one. And I was um, so convinced that virtual was fine. Virtual was great. Like, we don't need to do in-person. None of us want to get COVID. And I was so nervous. And I, again, just nervous to like, because it was my first in-person one, it was the first one I was going to see a lot of the people we interact with online constantly. Um, I just wanted to like present as professionally as possible. And I was just nervous of letting my team down and letting like the conference down, whatever. And uh, I, I've never been more happy to be wrong. Like the, it being in person was, I just like, can't express. It was like, like sleep away camp. Like you're so nervous to go. And you go and you're like, I never want to go home. Like, this is, these are my best friends. This is my family. And then uh, you hold on to that for a long time afterwards. And I just remember just sitting in these sessions in the back, just being like, what was I thinking? Like, this is such an incredible energy. I'm so glad to be in person. I haven't been to New York in years. Um, and I, I, I got a lot out of it as a, um, like, as from an employee's perspective, like I was like, okay, like, I can do this. I know I can do this, but I got so much out of it as a writer and I was not prepared for that at all. I think because I was so nervous um, to work uh, the event, but it, this conversation is kind of getting me thinking, I kind of feel bad for our speakers because it feels like, like we, like audiences always get the best um, experience of the thing, like in a, like a movie or something, like we get to see the final product. It's all like, it's magic, but actors and crew members, like they saw how it was made. So it's just kind of like, they remember the mistakes and the bloopers and, and stuff like that. And I'm curious, Ryan, from your perspective, as someone who's run sessions, what, and you've talked about this a little bit as someone who sits in on other ones while you're not there, but what is the one major thing you've gained as a writer from the conference? So with this conference in specific, I'm constantly trying to get a sense of my audience. And that's something I'm always thinking about as a creator in general, because that's ultimately what we're all doing. We're creating something that has a desired purpose or effect intended for a very specific audience. That's fiction, mm -hmm. that's nonfiction, that's everything. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I need to understand this audience better. I'm getting better at it and writing the magazine articles and things helps, but it's not always the same people who read the magazine who come to the thing. Oh, yeah. So uh, I've come enough times now that I feel like I'm getting a better handle on it. So. I do what a lot of writers do. I'm an eavesdropper. I don't mean to. I mean, I sort of do. I listen. I just listen to people. And that's a great bit of advice for conferences in general. You know, totally. talk a little less, listen a little bit more. But I can just hear the sorts of things they care about and they're interested. And it gives me a better appreciation. So I know that I can do a better job presenting. 
And I have no problem going off script, right? When I teach, like in the classroom, I don't have notes. I have an outline in my head and I will go off it in a second if I feel like that's where the energy is in the room. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to teach to some idealized version, some like Aristotelian archetype only in the heavens. I'm going to teach to the people in front of me. And I'm constantly reading the nonverbals. I'm constantly watching and feeding the energy of the room. And I will go after that because I want everybody to get their money's worth. I want it to be a positive experience. And so I yeah. watch other people navigate that, but also too, I'm just constantly absorbing it because I want this to be the best event they've ever had, the best conference they've ever had. And I know you all are working hard to make that happen, but it also depends on us as well too. So I'm trying to do my part as well too, because I don't want to be like, oh my gosh, you go to that, that was the worst one on earth. And, you know, and sometimes too, and I understand this as a teacher. I'm not the best teacher for everybody. I'm just not. I have a certain snark to me. I, I talk in a certain way. And sometimes it's just like, you know, great, but not for me. That's great. If you go to my fantasy and it just didn't quite hit you right, don't come to the next one on the next day. Go to someone else. Like, be prepared. Don't lock in and say, I'm going to go to this one and I have to go to this one. I've been to events where the main keynote speaker got sick and couldn't go. One of those times they asked me to do it two days prior. Like, it can happen. Like, you know, <laughs> things can happen, whatever. It's so like, if you're just, if your heart's set on this one thing and it doesn't happen as things do, we know this thanks to COVID and stuff, the world can change on a dime. Yeah. Um, you know, you never know that sometimes it's that one hour event was the most meaningful one yeah. of all of them, even above the keynotes. Like, and you had no idea. It was just a one off. And I encourage you to not just go and stay in your lane. Like if you're just a straightforward, mm -hmm. like fiction novelist person, that's all you do. Like, yeah, you're going to go see Conquering the Muddle in the Middle and some of these other things. Villains need love too. But maybe you should go to one of these others that has absolutely nothing to do with anything mm -hmm. that you're going to do. And like sometimes that's the one that just gets you thinking outside of the rut that you're in and opens up a world of possibilities. So having that flexibility and being open to those experiences can be really useful. So I went way off the answer to your question there, Michael, but like no. I was trying to say things. So there you go. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I really love that advice. And I do want to mention, I've, there have been people confused about this in the past. <clears throat> when you register for the conference, there is sort of a little, um, the registration process takes you through a little survey of what classes you think you want to attend. But I want to be very clear, you are not locked in to attending right. that session just because you expressed interest in it. That helps us on the back end decide which class is going to go in which room because there are rooms of different sizes. So not all of the craft uh, of fiction classes are going to be in the same room. They might one might be in the biggest room, the next mm -hmm. one, the next craft of fiction session might be in one of the smaller rooms. Um, choosing which one you have interest in does not lock you in. So when you get there, like Ryan said, if if one of the sessions just doesn't hit you the right way and you you know don't want to go back to that one or vice versa, you can change your mind and pick a different session. Um, this kind of goes along with um, one thing that you wish new attendees should know about the conference that we haven't talked about yet. And I, I have one that I think is pretty important. <laughs> we are going to be in New York City in August, and it is going to be incredibly hot. Um, <clears throat> chances are it's going to be sweltering outside and all of those hot buildings, um, you know, kind of create that concrete jungle, I guess. But when you go into the hotel in the conference rooms, it will be freezing. Oh, yeah. Make sure you bring a sweater and maybe a scarf um, because <laughs> most of the time, we, the conference organizers, have no control over the temperature in the hotel. Um, we definitely don't control the temperature outside. But if you go outside for lunch and come back in, um, you're going to be in for a shock. So bring a sweater. It will be the smartest thing you do. That's great <laughs> and necessary and important advice. Yes. Um, I was wildly unprepared last year for that. Um, I think kind of what we've all been saying a lot, which is like branch out, go to sessions that don't necessarily have anything to do with the genre that you're writing in. And also like really two more, th like attend each of the keynotes if you can and connect with one another. Because one of the, one of the things that was really lovely to see was like these little groups of, new writing communities um, flourishing from this 
larger writing community, which was everyone in attendance at the writing uh, writers conference. Because then we'd see people tagging us in pictures of them, like going out to dinner together or going to a Broadway show. And um, I think you have the best uh, experience if you do um, uh, let go of a little bit of the fear that a lot of writers have in, in um, chatting with one another and just uh, really like create a community within the community. Yeah, I think that's uh, really good advice. Uh, the one thing like kind of building off of that is remember that you're in New York City. Uh, so you might have a conference plan. Also have a plan for enjoying New York when you're not in the, the conference. Um, and, and that might be knowing some of the food places ahead of time that, that you want to try to hit or uh, different events. And then just also whether it's the plan that you have for the conference or the plan for the city, just always be willing to um, abandon the plan. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if something, if a conversation's happening, and you're really enjoying the conversation and the person you're talking with seems like they're enjoying it and another session is starting don't feel like you know we have to cut it short mm -hmm. uh enjoy that um and um yeah just just uh just remember like you know you're in new york uh and that's a like simon i think simon schuster's right across the street from like kind of catty corner from the building we're going to be in uh you're, you're you're surrounded by by publishing you're surrounded by culture with broadway just around the corner uh so much amazing food just uh just remember that uh it's not just that the hilton that we're going to be in mm -hmm. um, there's a whole world outside of the hilton i just realized i should write a whole article on this i got like a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll give two or three though one breath mints not just for yourself, but to share. It's a great icebreaker. Like, oh, did you need a break? Oh, my God. They're so thankful. You can make friends. Just buy a whole pack of, like, those, you know, whatever. Have them ready to go. Pass them out because you will you will appreciate it. Uh, another thing is before you go to the conference, actually spend three minutes looking up some of the people who are presenting beyond even the little bios on here. I am mm -hmm. constantly shocked by how many students in my classroom have never even Googled me, which sounds like a crazy thing, but like they don't know what I've written. They don't know what I've done. It is the lens through which I think and understand and teach story. And like if those things don't work for you, like we're probably not going to connect. Like I said before, I'm not the right teacher for every single student. I can teach anyone anything, but I might not be the best one. And there might be someone who's much more in alignment with how you want to be, how you, how you want to understand their blueprint to the world because it's very much like here. It's like all those things make an informed choice. Don't spend hours, but like a couple minutes, just checking out some of the main ones, spot checking. You just never know. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I would just do is I would bring your vulnerability. Like I would be open to doing things beyond what you're normally doing, right? I'd ask people questions, right? Um, follow up. Thank you. Say thank you for, for the things, you know, I mean, this is, there's so many different ways that we kind of shut ourselves off and we wear masks. If you are open and honest and connected and present everything will go better and other people will open up as well too to be a much more effective experience for everybody including you know the, the the professionals the industry folk as well too if you have an honest moment with them we can absolutely tell if somebody's kind of gaming like for mm -hmm. last year i've been working as an editor for bushel and peck it's a kid lit publisher so I'm now as editor out in the world as an industry person. And I can tell when people are just angling on me. Like, it's so obvious. Like, that's not professionalism. You can kind of do it in a professional way, but it's obvious and stupid and it's not very effective. <laughs> so, like, you know, just have a human moment with somebody. Mm -hmm. That's something I remember. Like, if we're just talking and having a decent time, that's what we want. That's what everybody wants. And my last little thing is this, too, in terms of what people want as an industry person. Every industry person wants the next pitch to be something they can buy. That's the, they all want it. Everyone wants the same thing. The writer mm -hmm. wants it to be bought. The other people want it to work. That's the magic. It just doesn't work most of the time, but don't assume that it's adversarial. They really want to help you out. Even if it's not a book they're going to buy, if you pitch them, they might give you something. And then there it goes to somebody else later. We all win there too. So 
Mm -hmm. Just keep that in mind. We're all kind of playing the same game. We're all sort of on the same team. And if you have that vulnerability, that sense of let's do this together and make the most of this, lots of great things can happen. Yeah, I I love that. That's a lot of really great advice. Um, all right, we've got one last question, and we can make it a lightning round if you want. Um, <laughs> what are you most looking forward to at this year's event? I'm just looking forward to seeing everyone again. That's what I enjoyed the most last year. Yeah, I really am looking forward to like being in person with my colleagues. And then also, I'm just like so excited to see Elizabeth Acevedo. <laughs> so many answers when i'm not with you folks broadway shows when i'm with you <laughs> two things uh one is i love getting questions i'm so excited about hearing mm. them because then i know i'm actually delivering exactly what they want but the other thing is too it's i wrote this book uh you know uh the the dummies guide for fancy science fiction horror like i have no idea how to compress that into one hour and deliver everything so i'm, I'm excited to see how i make that happen <laughs> Um, I am excited for the session lineup and I have to admit that I am biased because I created the session lineup, <laughs> but, um, I really tried to have a nice blend of speakers that we've had before, like Ryan and speakers who are brand new to us this year. Um, there are a couple that I'm very excited about Yasmin Ango and, mm -hmm. um, Bruce Holsinger and uh, there are several others who, uh, you know, and I should have the website open so I can look at them all, but writers whose work I really admire um, and I think have a lot to teach us. I'm very mm -hmm. excited to get some new instructors into the mix and have a nice blend of, um, you know, fan favorites and new to us instructors. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you all for taking the time to share your thoughts and what we can expect going into the 2023 Writers Digest Annual Conference. Uh, for more information and registration information about the conference, including the full schedule of sessions and the growing list of agents participating in the Pitch Slam, you can visit our conference website, writersdigestconference.com. And we hope to see you all there. Bye. Thank you.